Hi everyone, I'm Steve and um, it's uh, really, really lovely to welcome you to church this morning, particularly if you're new to church. Really want to give you a warm welcome. Um, a few years ago, well, when I was at university, which is a few years ago, <laughs> I had big questions about my faith. And, and even today, if I'm honest, I occasionally have thoughts of doubt that pop into my head on occasions. Um, and we live in a deeply sceptical society, don't we? Pretty much sceptical about everything. We doubt our government, the news, quite a lot of things we're told. In fact, I'd say the only thing we don't doubt um, is the importance of being careful about who we trust and what we trust. That's something we really have this idea of doubting and being careful. We see so many films, I don't know about you, but say, trust no one. And then halfway through the film, you're sort of thinking, oh no, they're going to trust this person and this, shit, that person's the baddie, you know? And you're thinking, ah! But actually, we, we need to trust through evidence, don't we? And that's where we should trust, based on personal experience or evidence. That's where trust comes. And we're concluding our series in 1 John today, the letter, the Bible letter. John is one of the original disciples of Jesus who wrote to Christians who were going through confusing times, and aren't we? And in our passage today, John says why he has written that letter. 1 John 5, uh, 1 John 5, 11 to 14. Might be helpful to have it in 1 John 5 generally because I'm going to refer to that quite a bit. Um, and um, he says this, this is the testimony or witness, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, whoever has, whoever has the Son has life, whoever does not have the Son does not have life, and this is the bit he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. John wants us to be confident about having eternal life. Now what does eternal life mean? Actually the word is much richer than something which just goes on and on. It's a quality of life and actually it's something that we, we can actually begin to have right now. Surely there is no greater question than this. Is there eternal life? Can we have it? Do we know God? Is there a God? So this morning we're going to briefly look at these questions, that I think, the, some answers that I think John would give from one John. I think his answer would be absolutely stick with Jesus. His, and I'm going to say three points. One is, Jesus is no myth. That's the first one. The second is, he is to be experienced. And love points to him. Do we know we have eternal life? Are we confident? If you doubt sometimes, you really are in very good company. I love, that Jesus, I love Jesus' response to doubting Thomas, who when the other disciples had seen Jesus risen from the dead, he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where his nails were, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. But Jesus' response to doubting Thomas was not to abandon Thomas as a failure, but he reveals himself to Thomas. And Thomas' history tells us that he took the gospel probably to India, and he died for his belief in Jesus. And then what I find most amazing is then even after the events where Thomas meets Jesus, Jesus meets the disciples in Galilee in Matthew 28, verse 16. And then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Then Jesus condemns the doubters, verse 18, no. He commissions them, he doesn't condemn them, he commissions them and says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples. Jesus comes 
to us in our need, in our brokenness, where we are. And some doubt actually is really quite healthy because it enables us to think through our faith and why we believe. However, we also need to recognise that some doubt is just our evil one, the adversary, the devil, who's just putting things into our heads and we need to just not listen to those. So my first point, and would be John's point, is that Jesus is no myth. Believing that he is God is not something that was changed from as we've come down time, that Jesus was just some man and, and then a couple of centuries later someone said, oh, he was really God. But there really isn't any evidence for that at all. John, as an eyewitness, speaks of Jesus' life and death. 1 John 1. I think it's the message version. From the very first day, we were there, taking it all in. We heard it with our own ears. We saw it with our own eyes, verified it with our own hands. The word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it and now we're telling you the most sober prose that what we witnessed was incredibly this. The infinite life of God himself took shape before us. We saw it. We heard it. And now we're telling you so that you can experience it along with us. I remember having huge doubts about whether I could trust the gospel writings at university. Were they made up? Were they changed over time? I found Greg Boyd's book, Letters to a Skeptic, uh, very helpful. He's giving good confidence in the reliability of the scriptures. Another book by Justin Breary, who runs a programme on ra Premier Radio that debates issues, has written a book called Unbelievable, subtitled, Why after 10 years of talking with atheists, I'm still a Christian. And as I've read the Gospels over the years, with some of these thoughts and arguments in my mind, I've come to realise that actually I really do agree with their, some of the thoughts that they have. That the Gospel stories don't read like things that are made up. They read like events that have really happened. There are many, many reasons we could give. But just one reason, just briefly for you this morning, um, would be that if you were making up the gospel stories, you wouldn't write the really embarrassing details that the first disciples doubted. I mean, after all, you're trying to persuade people that this has happened, and then you say that even the disciples doubted. How ridiculous is that to make up something like that? So if it wasn't made up, it really did happen. And then, you wouldn't invent that the first witnesses to the resurrection were women, who at that time, ladies, unfortunately, were rarely trusted to give evidence in court of law. So if it wasn't made up, it really did happen that way. And the Gospels are reliable about what we're hearing. I love this, what C.S. Lewis, the uh, famous for Narnia, but also what what he was, was he was an expert in ancient mythology. And this is what he wrote. As a literary historian, I'm perfectly convinced that whatever else the Gospels are, they are not legends or myths. I've read a great deal of legend and I'm quite clear that they are not the same sort of things. So you've had my view and you've had C.S. Lewis's view of the Gospels, have you? So, um, but you know, you can look up the Alpha film series, it's just superb if you want to question your faith and look at things and try and understand that they are amazing. So the first piece of evidence that might enable us to trust and be confident is that Jesus is no myth. Even in chapter 5, he's talking about a real Jesus that was there. Verse 6, he says, this is the one who, chapter 5, verse 6, he says, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. We perhaps don't understand all the background there exactly, but it clearly was about Jesus' baptism with water and his death on the cross. Jesus came in other words. And then he goes on. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is true. And this is my second point, 
The first point was Jesus is no myth, he's really come. The second point is that we have the witness of the Holy Spirit. I've often thought that when you look at the, the red, I thought that the resurrection and the miracles of Acts must have happened for the church to grow so rapidly in the face of opposition. And I know I've read this before, but I think this is very powerful. I love it. Um, and it's a guy called J.P. Moreland writes this. Okay, let's think about the start of the Christian church. There's no question it began shortly after the death of Jesus and spread so rapidly that within a period of maybe 20 years it even reached Caesar's palace in Rome. Not only that, but this movement triumphed over, every, over a number of competing ideologies and eventually overwhelmed the entire Roman Empire. Now, if you were a Martian looking down on the first century, would you think that Christianity or the Roman Empire would survive? You probably wouldn't put your money on a ragtag group of people whose primary message was that a crucified carpenter from an obscure village had triumphed over the grave. Yet it was so successful that today we name our children Peter and Paul and our dogs Caesar and Nero. <laughs> I like that. <coughs> But you know, so, but John, as he writes to the Christians there, he's confident that they know God. They have the witness of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And we read in chapter 2, verse 12, he says, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. They had that experience of forgiveness. Maybe you do. He says, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. There's that personal relationship with God over time that you know. I'm writing to you young men because you've overcome the evil one. There's something about them. they've changed in their lives because they know God. They've triumphed over sin. So there's some things there. Knowing forgiveness, overcoming evil, knowing God personally. And then in chapter 2, it's all about... People who know their God will begin to live like Jesus. Chapter 3 and 4 is all about because we know the love of God, then we will begin to show the love of God. And each of those are, are witnesses of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Again, the Alpha series, I think it's the third or the fourth, says, how can I be sure of my faith? Nicky Gumbel does a much better job than I'm sort of doing this morning. But I hope that you have and know your own personal stories with God. I make it a regular practice to remind myself of what God has done in my life. I've written them down, and when I walk along sometimes, I just go through them in my head. So I get to that place where I'm in a place of greater faith, so I can walk forward and do things for Jesus. You know, and I'm hoping you've got that yourself. But I also find it really helpful to read other people's stories, other people's biographies. So that even if this morning you don't have those stories, a good place is to read other people's stories so you can come to that place of faith and confidence in God. There has been a, a phenomenal growth in Christianity, of growth in Christianity in China, despite remarkable opposition, perhaps over a hundred million are Christians there despite the persecution. And I recently heard a university lecturer in the Chinese language who's very familiar with China, and he said that, you know, so many, almost, I think he said almost everyone who has become a Christian in China has had a miracle in their own lives or their family or they know someone near them. This is really illustrated by the book um, heavenly man, Brother Yun, describes how his father suddenly recovers due to prayer in Jesus' name. Let me read some of it to you. 1974. At that time, my father was sick. He suffered from a severe type of asthma, which developed into lung cancer. The cancer then spread to his stomach. The doctor told him he could not be cured and would soon die. 
My mother was told, told, there's no hope for your husband. Go home, prepare for his death. My dad's sickness sapped all our money, possessions and energy. And because of the poverty, I wasn't able to attend school until the age of nine. But then I had to drop out at 16 because of my father's cancer. My brothers and sisters, um, we just basically begged most of the time to in order to survive. And their mum was really distraught. Almost to the point where she, need, she, she she just thought, I can't carry on. How can I look after five children with a husband who's died? And then one night, my mother was lying on her bed, barely awake. Suddenly, she heard a very clear and tender, compassionate voice say, Jesus loves you. She knelt down on the floor and tearfully repented of her sins and rededicated herself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Like the prodigal, my mum came home to God. She immediately called our family to come and pray to Jesus. She told us, Jesus is the only hope for our Father. All of us <coughs> committed our lives to God when we heard what had happened, and then laid our hands on our Father, and, and for the rest of the night we cried out a simple prayer. Jesus, heal Father. Jesus, heal Father. The very next morning, my father found he was much better. For the first time in months, we had an appetite for, he had an appetite for food. Within a week, he had recovered completely and had no trace of cancer. It was a great miracle, miracle from God. We experienced revival in our family, and our lives took a drastic change. It was such a powerful time that today, almost 30 years after Jesus healed my father, all five of his children still follow God. And you think, well, that's, but it's the context, the suffering that they kept following God despite suffering. I think there's no strong reason to doubt such a story. And then again, in, in my moments of doubt or whatever, I recount not just my own stories, but actually I've got a number, number of other stories that I think of. So that I'm in, again in that place of walking in faith. So we can be confident, I think, because Jesus is no myth. Secondly, there's the experience of Jesus down history and our own experience. And thirdly, I want to point to suggest that love points to Jesus. Emma spoke amazingly about the importance of love last week. If you haven't heard it, look it up, listen to it. It was amazing, there's a real sense of that. We need to love and to be loved. That seems to be the essence of human existence, an entity. Most of the songs that have ever been written seem to be about love or loss of love. Love seems to be just such a, a huge thing in our world. Yet, if we take the pure science, no, I'm not going to say something, if we take the pure secular, materialistic world view that we are just chemicals, that we are just defined by our DNA and we have been, essentially we are programmed by our experiences and everything we do is just a chemical reaction, then love doesn't really exist. There is no freedom to choose, and you just do what your genes and your environment tell you to do. You might think that that's absurd. Well, Francis Crick, the, um, the guy that with Watson uh, discovered the DNA helix, uh, he's a biologist and neuroscientist, says this, you your joys and your sorrows, your memories and ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more, no more, than the behaviour of vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. Is that who we are? And um, Jennifer Fulweiler, who had that kind of view in her life, that very atheistic view of life, secular worldview, suddenly all changed when she had a baby. 
She writes this. I looked down and thought, what is this baby? And I thought, well, from a pure atheistic, materialistic perspective, he is a randomly evolved collection of chemical reactions. And I realised that if this is true, then all the love that I feel for him is nothing more than the chemical reactions in our brain. And I looked down at him and I thought, that's not true. It's not the truth. There's something much more going on here. Yet like Jennifer, what is most real to us is that we're here, that we love, that we have choices. There is something more than just chemicals and chemical reactions. And I think that points to us being spirits and, and that there is a spirit world that God sits in. And if there is a God, it would seem to me that he is far more advanced than us. He is a spirit, not just some force like Star Wars, the force be with you. You know, there is this God who is a personal God. And if God is more advanced than us, and we value love so much, is God not even more than us? And is God not love? 1 John 4 says that God is love. This is how God showed his love among us, that he sent his one and only son into the world, that we might live through him. At the very end of 1 John, we read in chapter 5, we know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. Jesus has come and revealed stuff so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. And whilst there were lots of other idols around, he's really talking about focusing on God because he's God. Don't get distracted. That just rings true in my heart. I hope it does. That the true God would be a God of love. And I think we can be confident that we have eternal life. We have a relationship with God. Jesus is no myth. The experience of Jesus down history. Love points to Jesus. John wanted the early Christians to be confident about their relationship with God so that they'd have peace and hope in troubled times. And God wants us to have this too. But, this life is not automatic. For John says, whoever has the Son has life. And whoever does not have the Son does not have life. At some point, we need to make a decision to follow Jesus and come into that wonderful, amazing relationship with God. We have this wonderful relationship with God. Not so that we might, well, God wants us to have comfort, but so much more than that. He's brought us into this relationship church that we might have a purpose, that we might be partners with him in what he's wanting to do in the world. Because the verse that I read, 5.13, says, I write these things that you may believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And then he goes on and says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We have this relationship so that we can pray. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have what we ask of him. There is a confidence in prayer, a boldness. It says, come freely. The word even is frankness. There's this incredible relationship that we have. And I remember as a new Christian being struck by this very simple, straightforward thing that if we ask it according to his word, one of the great theologians of our time is N.T. Wright, and he comments on his, his um, commentary on this. He says this, Those who believe in Jesus 
who abide in God can pray with a new, bold confidence. Let's move on the slides again. Um, Those who believe in Jesus, who abide in God, can pray with a new, bold confidence. They stand at the place where heaven and earth meet and are encouraged to draw down the blessings of heaven into the life of earth and to know that they make their requests that they have already been granted. Even though, as scripture itself and Christian experience both teach, they may be granted in ways that one had not expected. He gives a qualifying statement. And he goes on. The fact that one naturally tends to add that kind of qualifying remark is telling. Perhaps instead, one should just start praying a bit more thoroughly for specific things. Quoting this promise back to God. There's, such, there's that simplicity of prayer. Prayer changes things. Our confident relationship with God, and he responds to prayer. Jesus said, told us, your kingdom, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. This is the confidence as Christians that we have. But not only are we coming to this relationship with God so that we can pray, but we've the whole of 1 John is all about us coming into this relationship so that we might become people who look like Jesus. People who might begin to love the world, begin to love others, to bring in the message of beauty of Jesus into the world in which we live. That is what he wants for us. In a moment we're just going to reflect on some of the things I've said this morning. But I want to just end again with 1 John, the very end. He says, We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. My dear children, Keep yourselves from idols. We're going to um, just reflect now on some of those things. And uh, wonderful. Um, there's quite a lot of things there. What I suggest that you do in these few moments is to think of one, look at one of the reminder of faith questions. Okay. And then look at one of the actions of faith questions. And we'll just do that for a few.